Oh, here's learning objectives. So we're going to just talk about the differential diagnosis for events concerning for seizures. Um, I mean, they've done studies where they had seizure specialists look at clinical events to see if they could even figure out which, what was seizures and what's not seizures. And it's really hard just even by observing people to tell if they're seizures or not. So that's why different diagnostic testings are really helpful. Um, talk about the workup, talk about seizure classification, treatment, different comorbidities to be on the lookout for, and kind of long-term prognosis. So say a 38-year-old female presents to the emergency department and she had a convulsion about an hour ago, and you're seeing the patient, maybe this isn't super real, so maybe someone else saw the patient first, but you're seeing the patient, you know, what do you do? So obviously in neurology, we love questions. We love to ask history. Um, there's tons of questions that we would want to ask this patient in particular. So first I would want to know, has there been any recent medication changes that was an obvious trigger? Did she just get put on Wellbutrin or did she just get put on Tramadol? These are known offenders for lowering the seizure threshold. Um, does she have risk factors for seizures? So this includes childhood febrile seizures, significant head trauma. So that includes major things like dis depressed skull fractures or intracranial hemorrhages. Concussions actually don't increase your risk long term for developing epilepsy, um, but you can have seizures acutely. Um, is there any history of CNS infections like meningitis? Is there a family history of seizures? You know, what does she remember about the event? Did she lose consciousness or does she remember anything about it? Uh, did she get any sort of funny feelings or warning signs right before the episode happened? Um, and then if there's a witness, those can be super helpful and they can describe exactly what happened. Um, you know, and then what were they like afterwards? Was there any incontinence or tongue biting? So typically if someone bites their tongue with an epileptic seizure, they bite the, they bite the side of the tongue on the lateral aspect or their cheek, usually not the tip of the tongue. Um, what happened before? Like, what were they doing? Were, you know, what time of day was it? What setting was it? Um, what kind of things were going on around that time? Um, and you'd be surprised um, how many people forget to tell you, oh, yeah, I was on Tegretol like a couple years ago for these spells. So <laughs> ask them if they'd ever been on seizure medications in the past or are they on seizure medications now, obviously, is important. So here's kind of a differential diagnosis for things that can mimic seizures. So syncope, um, I like to tell the story, although my husband doesn't appreciate it, um, where I witnessed him having convulsive syncope when we were hiking once. Um, he likes to pass out. I've seen him pass out a couple times <laughs> from, from tearing his ACL and things like that. Uh, but we were hiking once um, in North Carolina, and he was kind of boulder hopping in a creek and slipped and hit on his tailbone real hard and you know that hurts real bad and he was like I don't feel good and the next thing I know he's laying on the rock convulsing like this so fortunately he was married to a neurology resident who was like wake up we gotta go um, I'm not gonna take you to the ER because you're just gonna be there forever for no reason and I know he didn't hit his head but you know convulsive syncope can obviously look like seizures um, different types of migraines that have positive or negative phenomenon can sometimes look like seizures TIAs um, vertigo, sleep disorders, so different parasomnias, especially if the episodes are happening nocturnally, um, delirium, movement disorders like dystonia. So there's kind of a broad differential. Um, and then don't forget, you know, psychiatric kind of base um, things like uh, psychogenic spells and that sort of thing. Um, so features that kind of favor epileptic seizures, an aura. So an aura with a seizure is actually the seizure. It's the start of the seizure. It's just when it's a um, just affecting a small part of the brain before it kind of spreads to become, you know, a more obvious seizure. Um, so that's why I ask warning signs. Sometimes that can be like the aura before a seizure. Seizures don't last very long. They only last like a minute or two. It's very rare for seizures to last longer than that. Um, you know, we're in the EMU all the time, making people have seizures, and, you know, it's really rare to see a seizure lasting longer than 90 seconds. Um, they're usually confused afterwards. Sometimes they can have an abnormal posturing. So particularly with temporal lobe seizures, one arm may be dystonic and the other hand may be fumbling. So looking for those types of features are helpful. Amnesia. Incontinence, although I have seen patients with psychogenic spells that have incontinence. Um, events arising from sleep. So if people are asleep and they have the episode and they're not waking up before, you know, suggests more of a seizure. Um, if they hurt themselves, they fell, hit their head, broke bones, that would be more likely to be a seizure. And eyes open. So this is a big thing. There's been a lot of research published about ictal eye closure. So when people are closing their eyes during their episodes, it's not a seizure.
So what do we look for? So someone comes to the ER, what kind of things are we looking for? We were looking for, you know, acute causes. So is it from alcohol withdrawal? Do they binge drink every day and then stop suddenly two to three or one to two days ago? Um, new medications we mentioned, like has there been some changes or new medicines added? Is there an electrolyte abnormality? So any one of us, if our sodium was 105, we could have a seizure, right? So checking, you know, for hypo or hypernatremia. Um, hypocalcemia, low magnesium, or high glucose. So we just had a patient not too long ago that came in with a blood sugar of like 750, and he had a provoked seizure from that. And recreational drug use. So it's good to do a UTOS because we know medications like cocaine, LSD, PCP, those can uh, provoke seizures. Um, and is it something more serious? So an intracranial pathology, is there bleeding? Do they have a subarachnoid or intracranial hemorrhage? Do they have meningitis or do they have a brain tumor? So these are all things that we're thinking about. So testing-wise, you'd want obviously check vital signs, check their finger stick, electrolytes, um, you know, check a CBC to see if there's any uh, signs of infection, head imaging, and at some point getting an EEG. So for head imaging, you know, there's two modalities. You can do CAT scans, you can do MRIs. So CAT scans are really quick, right? I mean, they take less than a minute to do. Um, so for people who are unstable um, or agitated, this is a nice screening tool. This is what will show you if there's anything really life-threatening going on because you'll see bleeds, you'll see increased intracranial pressure, you'll see edema, you'll see ma large strokes. So anything that's life-threatening you'll see on a CAT scan. But it does use radiation, so you have to think about that in certain patient populations like children or pregnant women. Um, and it's less detailed, so you can kind of see on the picture here that it's pretty grainy and, um, you know, pretty poor quality, although for the purpose, it, it does a pretty good job. Uh, but for people who have focal lesions associated with epilepsy, it's only gonna pick it up in about 30% of people. So the sensitivity is pretty low. MRIs are great. You know neurologists love MRI. I yell at my residents for ordering too many MRIs, but we like to do that. Um, they take longer, they're more expensive. So you know it takes like an hour and a half to get an MRI. So if someone's unstable or they're too agitated, they can't sit. I mean, how many times has someone come back from MRI because they were moving too much, right? Because it's degraded by motion pretty good. Um, and it uses a magnet, so that's a lot safer than radiation in certain people, like again, children or um, pregnant patients. Uh, but you have to worry about it, obviously, if someone has metal in their body, so shrapnel, pacemakers that aren't MRI compatible, um, vagus nerve stimulators, spinal cord stimulators, all these sorts of things. So unfortunately, you can't get them on everyone. But it's a lot more detailed picture of the brain, as you can see, compared to the two images. Um, so if you do an MRI, about um, a fourth of patients will have um, some sort of changes associated with that. So that means a large majority of people won't have any changes on their MRI if they have a seizure. Um, and then particularly for the adult population, a lot of adults have temporal lobe epilepsy, secondary to mesial temporal sclerosis, which is scarring over of the hippocampus. And so the MRI is really good for um, detecting that. So EEGs, um, you know, that, those are other tests that we love to do. Um, but the, the question always is, you know, what, why do we want to get an EEG? Is that going to change our management? And what type of EEG should we get, right? Because, you know, sometimes we just do routines or sometimes we do longer ones, and so what's our thinking behind those? So reasons to get EEGs, one's is spell characterization. So someone has a spell, you're not exactly sure what it is, you get an EEG, sometimes, you know, if there is an abnormality on that, that would be helpful. So EEGs, unfortunately, aren't very sensitive. So in most of the patients, you get an EEG, it's going to be normal, but if it's it's abnormal, that's really helpful, so the specificity is good. Um, it helps with seizure classification. So for our patients who we know have seizures, but we don't know what type of seizures they have, are they focal or are they generalized, and that's really going to change our management of the patient, we get EEGs to see if that helps us with that. And it helps for surgical localization, so our patients who have failed medications and we're thinking about surgical interventions, we get EEGs to see exactly where the seizures are coming from. Um, and to evaluate for status epilepticus. So if someone is confused after they had a seizure prolonged, they had a prolonged seizure and they're continuing to be confused, or there's any concern about status epilepticus, you can get an EEG to evaluate for that. So what types of EEGs are there? So a routine EEG is just a 20 or 30 minute recording, and it just kind of usually looks at the background brain waves, right? So if you're just gonna monitor someone's brain for 30 minutes, you're likely not gonna capture a seizure. 
um, but it can help to see if there's anything wrong in the background. Uh, some places have ambulatory EEGs. We don't have these here at U of L yet. We're thinking about getting them, where you hook the EEG to the patient's head and they go home for like two to three days and then bring it back. Um, there's continuous EEG, so you know we hook someone up um, to the EEG and we leave them on for hours or days. Um, that's a continuous EEG, and um, you can get video or not have video. And then for our surgical patients, if we can't tell what's going on with scalp electrodes, sometimes we put in electrodes inside the head. So there's subdural electrodes that get placed, or these depth electrodes that actually are placed sometimes, you know, in the hippocampus um, to further evaluate where seizures are coming from. That would obviously require like a craniotomy, and um, that would be a planned sort of thing. And usually during EEGs, we do certain procedures to kind of either increase the likelihood of the patient having some sort of abnormality or having a seizure. So we do hyperventilation as standard practice. The only kind of contraindication to that are people who have lung disease, um, who've had a recent stroke or heart attack, or maybe something like moya moya. Um, but hyperventilation generally is more helpful in children. You probably remember from boards, or if we have some MedPeds folks in here, you know, that. Um, can bring on absence seizures uh, in childhood absence epilepsy. Uh, usually don't see too many changes with adults. And then we do photic stimulation, so we do flashing lights in different trains. So we start at low frequencies, like three hertz um, for, I don't know, like six seconds or so, and then we increase the frequency up to 30 hertz. Um, that can bring on what's called either a photoconvulsive response, if the patient actually has a seizure with this, or something called a photoproxismal response if we just see an electrographic change. And a lot of times we do sleep deprivation. Um, and sleep deprivation can, one, trigger seizures, but also if we're doing an outpatient routine EEG study and we want to increase our sensitivity, capturing sleep can actually be very helpful for us because a lot of times sleep can activate, it, activate epileptogenic um, activity. So if we sleep deprive them, then they're going to be sleepy and they fall asleep on the EEG, which is nice and helpful for us. So if someone has a seizure and we do an EEG, initially probably only about a third are going to be abnormal. So again, it's not very sensitive. Um, if you do it fast enough, though, if you do it in less than 24 hours, you increase your sensitivity to about 50%. Um, if it's not normal, though, it's not exclusive of a seizure. Um, and you really need quite a bit of area on the, the surface of the cortex to even see an abnormality. So you need six square centimeters, which actually is a pretty big area, to actually have um, something show up on the scalp electrode. So if you have something small, I mean, the patient may be having things, but you're just not picking them up on the scalp. And this is just a sample um, EEG. This would be an inner ictal abnormality. When we talk about spikes, this would be a spike that we would be concerned about. So this is located in the temporal lobe, um, so in the right, yeah, the right temporal lobe. So this would be someone you would feel like probably are having seizures coming out of the right temporal lobe. So these are the types of abnormalities that we're looking for. So let's just go back to our patient. Um, you assess the patient. She's groggy but awake, and she can still answer questions. Um, she states that she's never had a seizure before, and she can't think of anything that might have caused it. Um, her muscles hurt, and she bit her tongue, and that's very painful for her. Um, the event apparently was in her sleep, and she doesn't remember anything. Her husband said that she had some jerking of all of her extremities for about a minute and a half. Um, and then when it was over and he was trying to talk to her, she had some difficulty answering questions. Um, her vitals and labs are stable when you're seeing her in the ER. Her exam is normal. Uh, she, you were able to get an MRI and an EEG in the ER, which isn't realistic, but in this case. Um, and they were normal. So everything's normal, 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 normal. She's sent home, outpatient follow-up, and she can't drive, right? So you guys know are aware. In the state of Kentucky, uh, you can't drive within three months of a seizure. Um, it varies by state. Um, Indiana, it's up to the physician. But in other states, it's worse. That's why I like to tell patients. In Rhode Island, it's like a year. So, you know, if they get upset, it could be worse. So what is a seizure? So a seizure occurs when there's like abnormal, excessive, or synchronous brain activity. So all the neurons are kind of firing all at once, which is very abnormal. Sorry about that. Um, and it can virtually take on anything that the brain can do. A seizure can be anything the brain can do. And I've seen some weird seizures. Um, for example, I had someone that was having seizures probably from their primary auditory cortex, and it would start with a fallout boy song. 
So any experience, any memory, anything that the patient has ever had and is stored in their brain, if that part of the brain is getting activated, it can be a seizure. Another example is that we just, the patient who had the high blood sugar, he actually ended up having a bunch more seizures. And his work, uh, visual phenomenon, so he's seeing halos. So he would see a halo in his left visual field. It was kind of blue-green, and then it would gradually fade away, and it only lasted about a minute. And we actually correlated that with his EEG. He was having seizures coming from his visual cortex. And he was sitting there and talking to us, no alteration in consciousness or anything. And he was having about 10 of these an hour. But you wouldn't have known it unless he told you. So epilepsy, by definition, is anyone who's had at least two seizures in their lifetime. So they had a seizure yesterday, and they had a seizure a week ago. So that's epilepsy. Um, I kind of cringe when I see seizure disorder. Um, so seizure disorder just means epilepsy. I think people use the word seizure disorder because they are scared to use the term epilepsy. Because I think a lot of times maybe patients don't understand what epilepsy is. I think patients think epilepsy is what kids get or kids inherit with. Um, but it just means that they've had more than two seizures in their life. And I always relate it to patients as in, you know, if you have high blood sugar, you have diabetes. So if you have seizures, you have epilepsy. It's just the diagnosis. And status epilepticus is a single seizure that lasts longer than five minutes. So like I said, most seizures stop after about a minute or two, but one that stops, keeps after five minutes, because if they're going to keep seizing after five minutes, they're probably going to keep seizing unless you do something about it. Um, or if someone has two seizures back to back and do doesn't return to baseline between hands. So those are the definitions of status. So a provoked seizure is what we're always looking for. So when patients come and they've never had a seizure before, we try to find a cause, right? So this uh, occurs in the context of some sort of insult, uh, like alcohol withdrawal or an electrolyte abnormality. This is something that, you know, the, we can find the etiology, we can point to it, you know, we can treat the underlying etiology, and the patient's never going to have a seizure again. So like I said, you know, anyone in this room could potentially have a provoked seizure if for some reason their blood sugar drop to 10 or something like that. But, you know, that would be a provoked seizure. It doesn't mean you're at risk for developing epilepsy long term. What we get real worried about are the unprovoked seizures for, like, our case patients. So someone who has a seizure and you can't find a reason why they're having a seizure. Those are the patients that are more likely to maybe have another seizure down the road because you didn't find an etiology for that seizure. So the lifetime risk of developing epilepsy is about 1.5 to 3.5%. Um, and so what we're talking about is if we didn't see a cause, so this would be an unprovoked seizure. So like our case, it's unprovoked seizure and everything is normal, like head imaging, everything is normal. The risk of having another seizure in the next year is about 10%. The risk of having another seizure in the next three years is 24%. And the risk of having another seizure in the next five years is about 29%. So that's higher than the general population, but it's still relatively low. Now say someone had a seizure and you do an MRI, and you see that they have some, like, encephalomalacia from a brain injury two years ago. They got in a car accident, had a traumatic brain injury, and you see some encephalomalacia, which is some softening or bruising of the brain. So there's some, like, brain damage. Or the patient had a stroke in the past or any sort of structural abnormality. That increases your risk of having another seizure because you can see that that probably was the cause and that cause isn't going to go away, right? Someone who had brain trauma, that brain trauma is always going to be there. It's never going to go away. So you can see that the risk of having a seizure five years is a 50%. So these are kind of two different patient populations that we treat a little differently. The pe person who has unknown cause, everything's normal, we probably aren't going to start seizure medications because their likelihood of having another seizure is relatively low. But someone who you see some sort of brain abnormality that is potentially epileptogenic. Those are the people, even if they've just had one seizure, I would think this person's at pretty high risk of having another seizure. Let's start them on a medication to prevent that from happening. So say the patient comes back to the clinic. It's been five weeks, and her husband said she had another one in her sleep. Um, he was at it, and then once she, he was out of town, she woke up by herself, was confused, and had gone to the bathroom on herself. Uh, so at this point, she's had probably about three seizures. So by definition, she has epilepsy. Um, and then at this point, you would want to start a medication because she's at risk for having further seizures down the road. So she started on a medication. Um, she was 38. She's still having a regular menstrual cycle and uses birth control pills for contraception, and she's just not driving. So our goal for treatment is seizure freedom. 
So let me repeat that. Our goal of treatment is seizure freedom. It makes me cringe when I see patients for their first time who've had epilepsy for 15, 20 years, has been on Dilantin and still has two or three seizures a month. Oof, that makes me cringe. Seizure freedom is always our goal. Now that may be more realistic in certain patients than others, but it doesn't mean that we stop trying. There's a lot of seizure medications out there now. There's a lot of new interventions out there right now. So we really you know, tr constantly make medication adjustments and adjustments to treatment plans for seizure freedom. But also don't forget about side effects. So you guys are probably well aware that side effects are really tied into compliance, right? So if someone's having a ton of cough from their ACE inhibitor, they're not gonna take it, then their blood pressure is terrible. So same thing with seizure medications. Medications, they, ha they can have some pretty nasty side effects. And if patients don't feel good, they're not going to take them. So that's another thing that's really important. And I try to really express to my patients, you know, I want you to feel like if you are having side effects, that they're tolerable. And once they get intolerable and they're affecting your quality of life, I want you to tell me because I don't want you to live, you know, in a miserable state. I mean, it's great. I'm glad you're not having seizures. But, you know, patients don't like it if their hair is falling out from Depakote or they gain 30 pounds. Um, and treatment is based on several factors, right? So I want to know what type of seizure someone has. So like I said, there's about 20 different seizure medications out there. Um, so, and we'll talk about the different categories. But, it, you know, it's helpful for me to know if someone has focal versus generalized seizures. And the side effect profile, so we talked about negative side effect, but a lot of the seizure medications have very positive side effects that people like. Like Topamax, that causes weight loss. Who doesn't like that? So, you know, I always try to fit the side effect profile that I think fits well with the patient. Drug-drug interaction is a big one, especially with the enzyme inhibitors and enzyme inducers, and then obviously the safety in pregnancy. So from the history, sometimes you can get clues as to whether someone's seizure is focal and onset or generalized and onset, but sometimes it's really hard to tell. Maybe the patient doesn't recall anything. The eyewitness story isn't very good. So the only way we definitively know if someone has focal or generalized epilepsy is if we can capture EEG abnormalities. So here's two examples of EEG. So this one kind of looks similar to the one that we looked at previously, and it has these focal discharges right here. So I know that this person, this is in the left temporal lobe. I know that this person probably has temporal lobe epilepsy with seizures coming from their left temporal lobe. So this would be someone who has focal seizures. This is an EEG that has generalized discharges. So they all start all at once and then they go, you kind of get a burst of this spike, spike and polyspike and wave activity. Um, this is an interictal discharge. I doubt this patient is, has clinically has any symptoms of this. Um, so I would know that this person has generalized onset seizures. So if we are lucky enough to get EEG abnormalities, they can be really key when it comes to treating the patients with certain medications. So like I said, there's a lot of seizure medications out there, and they're putting them out left and right with extended release and this and that and the other. Um, but typically we think about them in two kind of broad categories. We think of seizure medications as being narrow spectrum or broad spectrum. So the list of broad spectrum medications are great because they treat any seizures, they're broad spectrum, so that's nice. So say from the history, you can't really tell if the patient, what type of seizure they have, the EEG is normal. My practice typically is to start a broad spectrum medication. The narrow spectrum medications are generally only used for people who have focal onset seizures, and they actually can worsen patient, uh, patients who have seizures that are generalized and onset. So if someone has JME, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, which is a generalized seizure disorder, you would not want to put them on Dilantin or Tegretol because that actually can worsen their seizures. So it's always good to kind of have, um, kind of know. And the broad spectrum medications, like I said, can work for anything. And so they're the common ones uh, that we use, Lamictal, Keppra, you know, those sorts of things. Um, but obviously things like Dilantin, um, you know, Vimpat, which is like a new one, although they are doing some research study for this for generalized, it's not FDA approved yet. Um, Tegretol, Trileptol, those sorts of things, you would want to be careful in using them. Um, and did I put on there? So pregabalin and gabapentin, so Lyrica and Neurontin, we don't use too often for seizures, but I think those are important ones to think about because we use them for other things, right? So you guys probably use them for diabetic neuropathy. Um, people with epilepsy can get diabetic neuropathy. If you have someone with diabetic neuropathy and epilepsy, think about whether or not they have a generalized seizure disorder because you could start making their seizures worse. 
So side effects, we talked about the positive side effects. So seizure medications, AED stands for anti-epileptic drug. Uh, so AEDs that help with mood, so Lamictal and Depico, you guys know psychiatrists use for bipolar, and so it's always, you know, who couldn't use a little help with their mood, especially in a residency. So, you know, these are the type of medications that I like to use. Um, you know, medications that can help with pain, so Topamax, Depico, Lyrica, those can help uh, for like migraines, if someone has comorbid migraines, which is actually very common in the epilepsy population. Or Tegretol is, you know, used a lot of times for, uh, can use, use for neuropathy or like trigeminal neuralgia. And then we talked about Topamax causing weight loss. And this is kind of a busy slide. Again, if you guys want copies of this uh, for reference, it might be helpful. So when you're thinking about enzyme inhibitors and enzyme inducers, this is when you're going to get the drug-drug interactions going on. Um, and the one that scares me the most is with Coumadin. So if someone's on Coumadin and you're putting them on either an enzyme inducer or an enzyme inhibitor, think about, you know, what's going to happen to the Coumadin levels and that sort of thing, because that can be one of the scarier side effects. Um, and also both the enzy enzyme inducers and enzyme inhibitors um, can cause bone loss and increase the risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis. Um, and so if my patients have been on one of these medications for three to five years, they need a DEXA scan. Um, and I think a lot of times this gets missed a lot um, uh, by sometimes primary care. And what I usually tell the patients, because I don't know how to treat osteoporosis, because I'm a neurologist. But, so I usually have the patients ask their PCP to get the DEXA scan. So if you ever get asked by a neurologist to do one, that's probably why. Um, and then if they remain on the drug, then you just need to keep getting them every five years. Um, and if they do have osteoporosis or osteopenia, that's actually an indication to stop the medication. Just like if someone was on Depakote and their liver enzymes skyrocketed and you want to stop, them, stop the Depakote for that, this would be another reason that maybe you should stop the medication. And then Stevens-Johnson syndrome, um, most of the seizure medications can cause that. Um, it's very rare. For some reason, Lamictal has gotten kind of a bad rap for it. Um, but it, again, it's more often seen in people who the medication has started too quickly, uh, too high too quickly. Um, and it's also seen more in people of Asian descent as well uh, because of a certain HLA haplotype. So you might want to be careful about using the ones that cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome in patients with an Asian background. And then a lot of medications can cause hepatotoxicity. Um, so another thing that makes me cringe is people with hepatitis C getting loaded with dilantin. So if someone has a pre-existing liver condition, you probably wouldn't want to start a medication that can cause hepatotoxicity. Um, so here's a list of those, um, Tegretol, Trileptal, Depakote, Dilantin, those sorts of things. Um, and then a lot of medications can cause leukopenia or anemia. I've had to stop medications because their white blood cell count dropped. Um, so, you know, if you're getting routine labs and you see one of these things, it could be one of the seizure medications as a side effect. Um, and then in renal disease, too, uh, a thing that I commonly see happen, too, is patients have seizures and they have, like, chronic kidney disease and they're put on Keppra. So that's fine as long as it's renally dosed. And a lot of times that's not kind of um, paid attention to a lot of times. Uh, so always keep that in mind if someone's coming in with, you know, acute renal failure to make sure the medications uh, are constantly readjusted. And then for gabapentin, um, we commonly see myoclonus when people go into renal failure. So if you ever get a patient in acute renal failure and is having jerking and twitching, it's probably myoclonus from their gabapentin. And then the liver disease, some of these medications you have to decrease in liver disease as well. They're not contraindicated, but you may just want to reduce the dose. And um, a lot of the seizure medications can affect the EKG as well. Um, so carbamazepine, which is Tegretol, Lacosamide, which is Vimpat, um, and Lamictal can increase the PR interval. Um, so I know Vimpat has been used quite a bit in the inpatient setting by at least our residents. And so I always like to make sure that we have a baseline EKG um, before we start that medication, because if they do have a prolonged PR interval, I probably wouldn't start the medication. Um, and then azogabine is Potiga, which is one of the newer medications. They can increase the QT interval, so that would be another one you'd want to monitor those things. And rafinamide is Banzel. That's something that's used for Lennox Gesto. You probably won't see that too often in adult population, but it can affect the QT interval as well. So the major side effects, these are probably kind of board-type questions. Carbamazepine can cause hyponatremia. That's usually dose and age-dependent. Uh, trileptal, which is just 
very similar to carbamazepine, can also cause hyponatremia. Depakote, the big ones are tremor, weight gain, and hair loss. Those are things that women just don't want to hear if you're thinking about putting them on that medication. Um, and then Dilantin, you can get the gingival hyperplasia, which I've seen some pretty bad cases of. Um, and it can cause some cerebellar atrophy, which can cause some ataxia. Um, Lamictal, you have to be very careful because uh, oral contraceptive pills can actually decrease the drug levels. So if you have someone that their epilepsy is very well controlled and they've been on Lamictal and all of a sudden they start birth control pills, you may want to monitor the levels because they can drop in half and that could cause them to have some breakthrough seizures. Topamax can cause kidney stones. Um, I usually like to avoid it with metformin because it can cause a metabolic acidosis. Um, Zonagran can cause kidney stones as well. Tagabine, you probably won't see, it's not commonly used. It can cause some visual field deficits. Um, felbamate is another medicine, felbatol, you probably don't see very often because it kills people. Um, they didn't notice that <laughs> in the drug trials and then it came out past. So we usually only recommend it in kind of really refractory patients, last stitch effort. Bigabitrin, they use that for infantile spasms. That can cause the concentric um, visual field loss. People can get dizzy with uh, Vimpat, Potiga, which is a Zogabine, can cause people to turn blue, I guess, kind of like amiodarone. Um, and Parampanil, which is Ficompa, um, there always comes with the warning about suicidal and homicidal ideation. So some of these are very serious things, and obviously we really like to talk to our patients about the pros and cons of starting these medications before um, we do. So women with epilepsy, this is something that I particularly have an interest in. Um, and because I think that um, sometimes people don't think, you know, anticipate pregnancies because they're usually not planned. Um, and then people get really nervous. Oh, they're on a medication that's teratogenic. We, what do we do? Do we stop the medicine? And people get a little nervous. Um, so what I usually tell patients is in the general population, the risk of uh, some women, woman having a birth defect or a major malformation. So this is something that's life-threatening or needs surgery. That's about 1% to 2%. So with women who are taking seizure medications, that risk is 2 to 9%. And that 9% is an outlier. That's Depakote. It's usually around 2 to 4%. So it's relatively low, but it's still double, which is concerning. Um, and what I try to tell patients is that seizure medications are not safe in pregnancy. I mean, I can't tell them that they're safe. They're all category C and D. But some are relatively safer, I guess, than others. Um, our general rule is to avoid Depakote uh, because of the high risk of teratogenicity. It also has been associated um, with autism as well as decreased verbal IQ. Um, and then we always like all of our patients to be on folic acid. So if you're a woman with a uterus and you're still having periods, you're on folic acid. Um, that's what I try to tell everyone. And it has to be at least one milligram. So this is another point of confusion. Sometimes people think a multivitamin or a prenatal vitamin is good enough. It actually doesn't have enough folic acid. It needs to be at least one to four milligrams, which would be an extra supplement. In general, we say that the risk of seizures are worse than the risk of the medication. So if you have epilepsy, and you have to be on a seizure medicine for your epilepsy, you know, that's better than not being on your seizure medicine and having seizures during the pregnancy because seizures during the pregnancy can cause miscarriages, intracranial hemorrhages or hypoxia, D cells, those sorts of things in the baby. Um, so those tend to be a little worse. So we keep the medications. Um, but it's all about planning and counseling and make sure everyone's on the same page. Now, usually when I give this talk, people get real sad and then I feel bad. Um, so what I tell them is on the bright side is even though there is an increased risk, if you look at the big picture, there's a 98% chance you're not going to have any problems. And I like getting 98% on tests so that, you know, that doesn't seem too bad, right? So, I mean, the, ri the risk is there, but kind of look at the big picture. Um, I always encourage breastfeeding. That's another thing that people say you should avoid. But if the patient has been pregnant and taking Keppra during their pregnancy, and then they get Keppra with breastfeeding. Who cares? They've already been exposed to it. You just have to be careful that the patient or the kiddo's not getting like sedated or that sort of thing. But I always encourage breastfeeding because of all the positive effects with it. And then we talked about the bone health. So contraception is another big one and can really kind of get us into some trouble if we don't tell the patients what's going on. So the enzyme inducers, um, they can actually decrease the effectiveness of any sort of hormonal form of birth control. So people don't like it if you don't tell them that their Topamax is making their birth control ineffective and then they have a baby. 
and then they might have some problems because they were on Topamax and had a baby. So this is always something I like to tell people, you know, so Dilantin, Tegretol, Phenobarb, and Permadone we don't use too often, but those medications can decrease birth control. And then Topamax and trileptal dose dependent. So once they get above 200 milligrams a day of Topamax, which is common because that would be a kind of average dose, or uh, 1,200 of trileptal, then that's when it becomes an enzyme inducer and can interact with birth control. Um, Lamictal is interesting. It, can, it only affects progesterone-only birth control pills, so the little mini pills that are progesterone-only, that's the kind that Lamictal affects. But Lamictal generally doesn't affect the combined. Um, and then like we talked about earlier, the combined birth control pills can lower Lamictal. Yeah. So the IUDs are okay, yeah, because most those generally don't work so much with the hormones. I know like Mirena has some hormone in it, but it, you know the IUDs kind of work in a different fashion. So that's actually what we generally push is IUDs. So you don't have to worry about interactions and that sort of thing. So comorbidities with epilepsy, a lot of times they can have cognitive issues with kind of frontal executive function, attention, memory is a big complaint that we can get. Um, depression, so about 30% of patients who are medically refractory, so they have seizures, continue to have seizures, have depression. 19% uh, uh, have anxiety. Up to 7% can have a psychosis, and sometimes that can be related to the seizures themselves. Um, suicide is a lot higher, unfortunately. There's a high uh, comorbidity of migraines, as well as sleep apnea. And for sleep, a lot of times if we have someone with epilepsy and untreated sleep apnea and we treat the sleep apnea, sometimes we can make the epilepsy better, which is a good thing to screen for. And there's just an increase in mortality, which is two times the general population. And that's from SUDEP, which is called you know, sudden uh, unexpected death in epilepsy. Uh, so these are people who are medically refractory, continue to have seizures, um, who have increased mortality and you know, no obvious cause um, on uh, post-mortem. And these are usually seen in people who are males, people who've had epilepsy for a long time, uh, were diagnosed when they were younger, um, who have, you know, convulsions, um, frequent seizures, frequent drug changes on a bunch of drugs. So these are the, the, the people who, you know, have pretty bad epilepsy. So what happens with uh, seizure medication? So about you know 45% of patients will become seizure-free with the first medicine. So like our case, if we put her on a medicine, she has a 45% chance to become seizure-free with that first one. Now if we choose the appropriate medicine, we start a low dose, and we continue to increase the dose, but we reach the max dose, or she's having side effects, and we switch her to a second one, then about 20 per additional percent of patients will become seizure-free. So after trying one to two medications, about 65%, which is the majority of patients, will become seizure-free. Um, what I tell patients is, unfortunately, once you fail two drugs, your risk of becoming seizure-free, that's our goal, right, is less than 5%. It drops off pretty quickly. So then the question is, is what do you do? So with our case, say she's been having seizures for two years, um, you know, she was on one drug, we kept increasing levels, um, we switched her to another medicine, but she's still having seizures. So, you know, this would be someone we call medically refractory or treatment resistant, if you've heard those terms. So we use those terms in people who have failed two seizure medications. So the first thing you want to do is, do you have the diagnosis correct? So for 25% of these patients, they don't got epilepsy. So then you got to figure out what's going on. So do they have you know, psychogenic spells, do they have a cardiac arrhythmia, are we missing something else? Um, and for patients that have focal seizures, then we can do epilepsy surgery, like resection. Um, there's also a lot of devices out now that stimulate, uh, do neurostimulation. So you may have heard of the vagus nerve stimulator, which is a pacemaker device implanted in the chest. It has a lead connected to the vagus nerve in the neck, and it provides stimulation to that constantly. Or this new thing called RNS, or the NeuroPace device, which I think is really cool, and I'll show you pictures later, but um, it's implanted stimulators into the brain, and we can um, program that, and it detects seizures, and, and it can respond to the seizures by st stopping them and stimulating them. Uh, I think we've implanted at least one patient here at UofL with that device. Um, and there's different diet therapies. You may have heard of the ketogenic diet or the modified Atkins diet. Or there's always clinical trials, too, experimental drugs, CBD. Everyone's interested in that. 
Um, so for surgical interventions, we can do a lesionectomy, so we can take the lesion out. So if they have mesial temporal sclerosis, we take out the hippocampus. Um, we could take out a big lobe, so we could do a temporal lobectomy. Or we could do a corpus callosotomy, so we can, you know, well, I can't, neurosurgeons can, but they can <laughs> take, uh, cut the corpus callosum in half. And that usually is more palliative for people who have intractable generalized seizures, and that way they can't generalize anymore because you've disrupted the tracts. Um, you can do a hemispherectomy where you take a whole hemisphere out. Or you can do things called a multiple subpeel transection, which is kind of like a maze procedure on the brain. You just kind of make a bunch of marks, and what you're doing is trying to disrupt um, the networks of the brain that's causing the seizures. Um, and unfortunately, once we do these and people can become seizure-free, they still have to be on their medicines. I think that's a big misconception is if you have surgery, you can come off the meds. That's great. But really, only 20% of patients can actually come off the medications after surgery. Um, so seizure freedom really varies uh, with surgery, and it depends on how long you follow patients. So, you know, if you look at a study and they only follow them at one year, the data may be better if they follow them up for 10 years. Um, and it also depends on if it's lesional or not. So if you hear about lesional epilepsy, that means their MRI shows something or it doesn't. Is there a lesion on the MRI? So for temporal lobe resections, which is more common in the, the adult population, the rate of seizure freedom is about 50 to 70% which is way better than less than 5% with medications. So I know patients get very nervous when you talk about brain surgery, um, but it's just day and night. And that's why this is standard of care, is that there's just a drastic difference in just fiddling around with medicines after you fail to versus going in there and just taking it out. Um, if it's in the parietal, frontal, occipital lobes, the data's not as good. Um, 25 to 60% of that's pretty wide range, but it really just depends on, again, how long you follow the patient and if the MRI was, uh, had something on it. Um, so you may have seen this. This is the vagal nerve simulator. Um, so this is the pacemaker, and then it goes to the vagus nerve, and either a neurosurgeon or NT delicately wraps <laughs> the vagus nerve with this electrode. Um, and so we have tablets now that are connected to, this is the programmer, so you put the programmer over the pacemaker, and you can uh, vary how strong the nerve is getting stimulated, how often it's getting stimulated, and those sorts of things. And usually patients tolerate this really well. Um, the only thing people can have sometimes if you put it on too high is a lot of coughing, um, or their uh, voice will be kind of off, so they'll have some problems with their voice. Um, but otherwise, people tolerate really well. But the one thing to know, I guess, um, is if someone just had their VNS adjusted and it's really bothering them and it's like at night or on the weekend or something, they have a magnet. And what that magnet is is it activates it. So it, the VNS is always going off, but if you want to deliver an especially strong kind of stimulation, they have this magnet. If they just swipe the magnet over, it stimulates it. If you just tape the magnet over their little um, generator in their chest, it'll turn it off. So if you ever get phone calls about that, that's usually pretty helpful until they can see their neurologist. Um, and this is the NeuroPACE device. So this requires surgery, and you have to know exactly where the seizures are coming from. But for people who can't have surgery, say they have seizures coming from more than one area, you have two leads. So you can either have some sort of like strip or this depth electro, and you put it where the seizures are, and then this generator is uh, screwed into the skull. And it's actually collecting data. It's actually picking up on seizures. And then it's also stimulating the seizures when they're getting detected. And you can continue to fine tune and program that so it becomes more sensitive. So this is actually a pretty exciting device that we have out now. Um, the ketogenic diet um, is terrible. You cannot eat this. So this is usually for people who have G-tubes and you know kiddos with bad syndromes um, that have intractable epilepsy because it's real ha high fat diet. So you have like four fats to every protein and carb. Um, so it's very restricted. Again, unless you have a feeding tube, people are not going to tolerate this. Um, they're really not sure exactly the mechanism of action. People think it has something to do with ketosis. I think there's some stories about like ancient Egypt where people had seizures and they would fast and make their seizures better. Um, this is kind of along the same line. Um, but there is some contraindications. So people who have pancreatitis and hepatic failure and some other sort of enzyme uh, diseases, uh, deficiency diseases, uh, it'd be relatively contraindicated. In the adult population, this is not something that we typically use. Uh, people have tried the modified Atkins diet. Um, so modified Atkins, if you do the Atkins diet, like the first part of the diet is like really rigid where you only have 20 grams of carbs and then after you 
to that if you're doing the Adkins diet, then you get more carbs. But if you're going to use it for epilepsy, you have to limit it to 20 carbs a day, which is like a piece of bread. This one's really hard to do as well with the American diet. But some people try it. And there's been some studies to show that has been helpful. Um, so I'm running over my time. I guess the main thing to think about status is, you know, just to clarify between kind of clinical and convulsive status versus subclinical and non-convulsive status. So obviously if someone's in front of you having a big convulsion, then that's very easy to identify as convulsive status. Um, but what we get consulted for a lot and what we're always concerned about is non-convulsive status. So if um, someone had a long seizure and then just was confused or someone's been in the hospital and just acting a little off, some other kind of um, symptoms could just be agitation, uh, personality changes, you know, very subtle kind of motor um, symptoms. Um, those can be subtle signs of non-convulsive status. And they've done studies, like if you hook up everyone in the neuro ICU to continuous EEG monitoring uh, without any clinical suspicion, 10 to 20% of patients are in status. Um, so I usually have a pretty low threshold for evaluating for this. Um, and common causes are stroke, someone who has epilepsy and is on um, low levels of their medications, like they quit them or miss some doses, someone who had a remote brain injury, uh, congenital malformations, and certain medications. I will point out uh, cefepime. Interestingly, when I was a fellow, we had like three or four patients who had renal failure and was placed on cefepime, and they went in non-convulsive status. So if you ever have someone in renal failure on cefepime and they're acting funny, call and consult us because they may be in status from a cefepime. And treatment-wise, we start with benzos, and if that doesn't work, then we give IV formulations of the medications. We try one, we may try another one. If those things fail, then a lot of times we use, do a medically induced coma. Um, I will say there's a caveat. We're more aggressive with convulsive status than we are for non-convulsive status, and there's not great guidelines about when to be more aggressive because it doesn't have as much high comorbidity. So you may see us being maybe not as uh, aggressive in people in non-convulsive status just because you have to think about the risk versus the benefits, right? And we all know that, you know, propofol drip is not without its negatives or concerns. So let's see. All right. So just kind of overall things that I think are important to add. Um, you know, someone who has two seizures, they have epilepsy, no dancing around it. Um, I would avoid seizure disorder because sometimes that just confuses them with the terminology. I've had patients that have had seizures for 15 years, and I tell them they have epilepsy, and they're surprised because they just didn't know that that was the term that they had. Uh, we're always actively managing medications with our goal of seizure freedom. Um, if patients aren't responding to medications, always reconsider the diagnosis. That's why we have the epilepsy monitoring unit. It's very helpful. About half the patients coming through there don't have epilepsy. Um, standard of care is to consider epilepsy surgery after two appropriately chosen seizure medications fail um, to control seizures. And they have to be focal. We can't do resective surgery, obviously, if someone's having generalized seizures. Um, and don't forget about comorbidities um, that affect quality of life as well.